once came to Jesus by night to ask in the way of salvation and light. Do you ever inadvertently get in the way of Jesus? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and hear ye him. Ye must be born again, again, ye must be born again, again, I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Good morning, and welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. My name is Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. On today's episode of the podcast, we continue our study of the gospel according to Mark. The purpose of this study is to prepare our minds for the Book of the Month sermon series throughout the year 2023. The Book of the Month for January is the gospel according to Mark. We'll finish up chapter 8 today with verses 27 through the end of the chapter, and we'll go into chapter 9, where we'll talk about the Mount of Transfiguration. If any questions or thoughts arise as you go through this study with us, we encourage you to put them in the comment section below for discussion. Ye must be born again, again, ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again, again. Let's get into the study. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. He is the Christ. Who do you say that Jesus is? We've talked in a previous episode about C.S. Lewis's trilemma, and you should have noticed that it's not original with him. He just outlined the thoughts of the people of Jesus' time in a way that we modern Anglophones can easily understand and remember. He alliterates it. Jesus did, in fact, claim to be the Son of God. So if Jesus is not the Lord, then he is either a liar or a lunatic. These are your three options. He can't merely be a prophet or a good teacher. He is not simply a man. If he is, he is no more authoritative, perhaps even less so, than anyone who might be born today. Of course, that is what people want. They want to be the authority in their own lives, and the more wicked among us desire the authority in the lives of others as well. But here we come to the central idea of Mark's account of the life of Jesus. He is the Christ. Some thought he was John the baptizer, or one of the Old Testament prophets, but Simon, Peter, buzzed in first. You are the Christ. What does this mean to Peter? Jesus had the words of eternal life. He had believed and come to know that Jesus was the Holy One of God, John chapter 6, verses 68 and 69. In Matthew's account of this great confession, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Again, I want to point out that this is the easy thing to recognize. Jesus is the Savior. He is the Son of God. The difficult thing is recognizing how he will save us as the Son of Man. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. Get behind me, Satan. So Jesus began to teach them plainly, openly, not hiding any of the details how the plan was going to pan out. Jesus was going to suffer, be rejected, be killed, and... Peter probably stopped listening right there, got up, walked up to Jesus, grabbed his arm, yanked him aside, and said, No, Jesus, I told you that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the King, the heir to David's throne, and you are going to sit on that throne whether you like it or not, even if I have to tie you to it. Jesus was speaking openly. Peter pulled Jesus into hiding. Well, you wouldn't want your king to seem wrong. You'd give him the opportunity to correct his mistake. I mean, clear up any misunderstanding. The misunderstanding, though, was Peter's. He failed to listen to the rest of the plan. The Son of Man must, after three days, rise again. The idea of the resurrection always throws people for a loop. It just doesn't happen. It's impossible. Death is the end. Being killed is pretty final, wouldn't you say? This is often the point where people in the book of Acts stop listening to the apostles. Peter was no different here. When Peter heard Jesus would be killed, even though the idea of a resurrection was in Jewish thought and scripture, 
See John chapter 11, verse 24, and Job 19, verses 25 through 27. Even though it was in his thought, his scripture, he stopped listening. So Jesus returned the rebuke back on Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Peter was being the adversary, the accuser, accusing Jesus, the one he just recognized as the Son of God, of not having the plan right. Jesus told Peter, You're not thinking about this correctly. You are blocking me from doing what I need to do. You are hiding the true plan of God from the disciples. Get out of my way. Do you ever unwittingly get in the way of Jesus' goals? Mark chapter 8, 34 through 9, verse 1. Yes, let's get behind Jesus. Jesus gets back out into the open to where he can speak to his disciples unimpeded. Moreover, he chooses to speak his next words to more than just the apostles. He called together the crowd to show how to come after him. After, interestingly, is the same word that Jesus said to the adversarial Peter. He needed to get behind him. After and behind are the same word. You have to get behind him to follow behind him. And how do you do that? Jesus explains, number one, you deny yourself. Think of someone you love. Would you do anything for that person? Anything that they ask? Do you trust them that much? Would they do the same for you? Wait, is that person you? Many people love only themselves. They may claim to love others and show some love to others, but they do it in a way that makes anyone observing ask, are they only doing it to further their own agenda? To be Christians, to show love for Christ, we are to trust Him and keep His commandments. John chapter 14 and verse 15. But if Jesus loves us, should he also trust us and keep our commandments? Is that the meaning of John chapter 14 and verse 14? If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That idea mixes up the order. He is the head. We are the body. He gives the commands. We can make requests, and he will want to meet our needs and even our godly desires. But the final authority comes from him. He decides where we go. Do you desire to save your life? That's the wrong question. For whom and for what are you willing to lose your life? Take up your cross. What are you anxious about? What do you suffer? What is troubling you? Can you bear it? If you follow Jesus, there may be desires you want to fulfill, but Jesus says, no, this is not the place. Your friends and acquaintances may say, Stop here and rest like you used to. Jesus says, no, this is not the hill to die on. You may be mocked, derided, ridiculed, and scorned, but you follow the truth. Their truth is based on the lie that this is all there is. You could gain the world, but if you forfeit your soul, what price have you paid? And what can you give to get it back? Follow him. You could listen to the world and just stop. Plant your cross wherever you happen to be. Not that it's comfortable. It seems better, though, than going on. Maybe you could find some friends who would take you down from your cross. You just have to stop long enough for them to do so. But Jesus says, keep going. But, ugh, this is so shameful. If, though, you look around, you'll notice the people calling out to you to stop are on their own crosses. They've stopped, if they've ever begun to begin with. Jesus says, don't be ashamed. The Son of Man will return in the glory of his Father with many thousands of his holy ones. Jude 14. Jesus says, follow me. The generation that was hearing Jesus, whether they listened to him or not, were going to see the powerful arrival of the kingdom of God. They would be given a reminder of the words of Jesus by those who were inspired to accurately repeat them. They would be given another opportunity to deny themselves, take up their individual crosses, and follow Him. There would still be those who wouldn't. They would remain in their shame, and they would pull others back into theirs. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. Hear ye Him. Even though Peter had gotten in Jesus' way, 
he is still part of the inner circle of Jesus' apostles. He and the Sons of Thunder were taken up on a high mountain to see something spectacular. Interestingly, Mark here specifies a length of time, which not having the specific time of the previous account makes the declaration practically useless. Six days later? Six days later than what? But there must be a reason for its inclusion. Perhaps it's numerological. Six is a number of complete fulfillment. Mark's central point has been expressed, and now it's time to tell the importance of the fact that Jesus is the Christ. I'm not sure we can discount the figurative importance of numbers in the literal accounts of the Bible. Christians of old have often said that you need to understand the numerology to understand the Scriptures. Another possibility is that we are told how far away the Mount of Transfiguration is from Caesarea Philippi. It took them all of six days to get there. Luke includes the partial days on either side of the full days when he said, some eight days after these sayings, Luke 9 verse 28. But turning our focus back on Jesus, we see the splendor of his transfiguration. His clothes became pure, bright, white. But then we also read about how Elijah and Moses appeared, talking with Jesus. What are we to make of these men appearing? Some focus on the fact that these were men who represented the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. I wonder if they are conferring on Jesus, the king, their roles of prophet and priest. Moses interceded for the Israelites in a priestly way on several occasions, even though it was his brother Aaron and his sons who were tasked with the job more permanently. Still, others point out the similarities of their lives with that of Jesus. They each had withstood tyrants for the benefit of an ungrateful and disobedient people. They were each simple and unlearned men. They both had despised the wealth of this world. They both chose rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of whatever kingdom they were living under. They were looking for the reward. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 25 and 26. Granted, those verses are speaking of Moses in particular, but I think they could apply to Elijah just as well. Were they giving Jesus encouragement for what he was about to endure? Or was it more for the apostles so that they could say, We did not follow cleverly devised tales. We ourselves heard this utterance, 2 Peter 1, verses 16 and 18. It's interesting that Peter makes this comment because he is the one who learned the most from this experience. In his own impetuosity, which was the impetus for his impetuously confessing that Jesus was the Christ, as well as for his petulant pulling Jesus aside to rebuke him. He here quickly comments that they should build three tabernacles, one for each of the men appearing. How did he know that they were Moses and Elijah? Maybe they introduced themselves, or Jesus introduced them, or inspiration introduced them. Or... Poor, impetuous Peter gets disciplined again, this time by the Father himself. He heard that utterance all right. Listen to him. Conclusion. The Son of Man is the Son of God. Do you ever inadvertently get in the way of Jesus? You may recognize who he is, the Son of God, but do you recognize what that means? Do you recognize that he is also the Son of Man? He is the only one who can rightly tell us of God's plan to save us. We may have our own ideas, but they'll fail. We may want to say to God, this is the way I think it should happen. But God says, get behind me. Don't stand in my way. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and hear ye him. Ye must be born again, again. Ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, we invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, 
Email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. Thank you for listening.